Good evening, everybody. Now, a few folks are still uh, finishing up uh, your dinner, but if you haven't, uh, grab some dessert. We have a pretty good selection out there. Our speaker this evening is uh, Andy Junkin, who is the author of Farming with Family Ain't Always Easy. Andy's passion is to change how farm families make decisions together. He has written three books and has a syndicated column in nine farm magazines on three continents. Um, and he works daily with farm families in Ontario and across the Midwest. So, Andy, we'll let you take it away. I appreciate that. Thanks very much. Thanks. <laughs> My name's uh, Mark Andrew Junkin, and I improve how farm families make decisions together. Folks always wonder, what does that mean you improve how farm families make decisions together. I say, well, if you've got a sick cow, you call yourself a vet. If you've got a tax issue, you get yourself one good accountant. If you've got a legal issue, you get yourself one heck of a good lawyer. But the question is, if you have problems making decisions within your family, <laughs> who do you call? Well, until now, there's no one you can call on, except for Jack Daniels. And he can help you alleviate the pain, but not solve the root issues. My name is Mark Andrew Junkin, and I improve how farm families make decisions together. Um, just a little bit about me. The only thing you need to understand about me is two things. I like to have fun, and I live to save farm families. I'm the seventh generation farm boy from a little town called Bob Cajun. There is nobody that wanted to go home and continue a seventh generation family tradition more than I did. Unfortunately, the soft issues in agriculture became hard problems. And my parents got divorced as a result of our succession experience, and farm succession simply was not successful. And what I've done with my life is turn lemons into lemonade, and I live to fundamentally change how we do succession planning in North America. You know, here's the problem we have in succession planning as far as I'm concerned. We put the cart before the horse. We put the cart before the horse. How many far, I mean, in succession planning, everybody's always focused on the transfer of assets. Okay? Everybody's focused on that 10 minutes when you sit down in the lawyer's office and you sign the paperwork to transfer the assets from one generation to the next. Now, there might be 100 hours of time with your financial planner, your succession plan, your accountant, your lawyer, going to putting together that deal. But that's only 10 minutes of the farm's history. Nobody's ever thought about the 10 years before that moment when you have multiple generations and multiple siblings butting heads. Nobody's ever thought about 10 months after dad's funeral. Can the successors succeed at farming? And I think the way we're doing succession planning has got to change fundamentally. And what I focus on, I've created a completely different type of service. You know, what the folks are doing as far as financial planners, lawyers, and accountants, still got to continue. What I've got is a completely different type of service, which focuses on the transition of management from one generation to the next. What I do is I focus on working with families three to five years before we even start talking about succession planning. However, 80% of my time now in Western Ontario, I'm actually a professional mediator. Um, I get called out to deal with the toughest of the tough situations. and. Uh, Four times in the last five years, I've had to take guns off of farms. I've had guys grab me by the throat, raise me by the, on their wall. I, get, I have a 90.3% success rate. And it's usually in, in, in Ontario, it's about 25% success rate usually for the mediators. And the reason why is I know what it's like to wake up on Christmas morning, 500 miles away from home, milking somebody else's cows. And that's why I'm successful. But my life goal... It's not meat farms, you know, on the worst day. My focus is to change how we're doing succession plan uh, planning fundamentally. But I, I'm trying to uh, written uh, three books and writing nine farm magazines because my focus is getting families to proactively change how they're doing succession planning. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about is my method of how I, I chair family business meetings once a month. And my focus is on continuously improving how we're working together from a farm management perspective on multiple levels. Now, 
I have a company called Agriculture Strategy. You know, everybody in the countryside thinks, oh, you, Agriculture Strategy, you go around the countryside telling people what to do. Well, that's not me, that's my uncle. What I do, what I do is I never try, I try to never tell farmers what to do. My focus is to, the farmers I work with are way smarter than I am. Meet one of my clients, Mike. Right, you want to raise your hand? He's way smarter than I'll ever be. What my focus is on is improving how the families sit down and make decisions together by getting everybody to focus in on what matters. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about, now, in my belief system, if you're a preacher, and if you can't say what you have to say in 20 minutes, it's not worth saying. So I hope you don't mind. I've been asked to speak here for an hour. So what I hope to do is in the next 20 minutes, talk about my area of interest, and then we can open up for a really good discussion, if that's all right with you folks. Um, what I'm interested in, I have a lot of varied interest in the field of succession planning and, and farm management. What I'm going to talk to you about tonight is an area of interest of mine, is the science of decision making. I'm interested in three different things. How do we make decisions together as a family? How do we get those decisions into reality? And how do we transition decision making from one generation to the next? What I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, it's just not rocket science. It's just plain common sense. But it will, if you apply it to your farm, it will skyrocket your profit, profitability. And most importantly, it make Christmas dinner next year a lot easier to, uh, to deal with. I make farming fun again. So let me tell you a bit of a story. I dated this girl in university. I actually dated a lot of girls at university, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> and I called home to mom. I said, Mom, I found the perfect girl. She's a farmer. She's good looking. She's smart. She's she's good 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 uh, personality. And she loved farming even more than I do. And I uh, went on a couple of dates with this girl. And then she stopped gaining interest in me. And I, I asked her what was going on. She says, you're a nice boy, but your dad doesn't have enough cows. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, was, that was a different girl. Uh, <laughs> anyways, the point of it is, is that this girl, she was uh, very motivated. She was driven. She was European. Go, go, go kind of girl. And she did it. Uh, seven years later, I was in the kitchen of her in-laws mediating the, uh, their, their family dispute. And what she had done, she had married a guy with 400 cows, which is Ontario, is a large operation. And she was hard working. She actually walked into that barn and they had squeezed out an extra 20% of production just by little things. She had uh, death loss in that, that calf barn when she took over went from 30% death rate down to 1%. She was really turning that operation around. Now, one day, the nutritionist showed up with a, PhD, a guy with a PhD in nutrition with a feed salesman. And uh, they, uh, the dad was showing around the farm, uh, the, 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 the farm around to this uh, PhD and was bragging basically about the operation, which some men are very proud to do. So he came out of the barn and she had some very specific questions for that nutritionist. She didn't think the cows were milking the what they should be. And all of a sudden, she went from the ideal daughter-in-law to the witch that had to go. Right? How many farms do you know of that where you have an ideal son-in-law or ideal daughter-in-law or an ideal son or an ideal daughter and all of a sudden, they throw the baby out with the bath water because these families don't know how to problem solve. It's quite common in Western Ontario. I imagine it's common down here. In farm succession, I remember talking to these folks about at a booth at, at the farm succession. They, they told me about how good things were going on their farms cars, as far as farm succession. And all of a sudden, things slid downhill. I just want to read this. This is the only text that you need to watch for the night. <laughs> we'll cover this. <laughs> you don't think farm succession is going to be a problem for your family until you've got a problem, okay? So I, this, is, this is the farm. So um, Thomas Henry Ford, he started paying five times the going wage for laborers back at the turn of the century. 
And his attitude was, I'm going to hire the best and fire the rest. You know? Has anybody here ever watched the show The Apprentice? Okay, so, okay. Miss, what, the lady in the pink. Tell me about the premise. What's the story? What's the premise of the show? For those of us that don't know, there's Donald Trump. Yes. He's, he's got great hair, doesn't he? Oh, he's yeah. And, uh, he has two teams. He t yes. Often they're famous. Yes. They compete against each other. To yes. Do a task that he has, he or his group has assigned. Yes. And they try to get the best revenue, or there's different tasks. Yes. And someone wins. Someone wins, and what happens if somebody loses? The team that loses, the boss is fired. Somebody gets fired every week. Yep. Okay. This attitude of, now, to fire somebody every week, that works fine for General Electric. They fire 10% of their staff every year. That works for, well for a big corporation like Donald Trump. But on a family farm, you just can't fire Grandpa because he flips a buggy. Right? And the reality is that how many family farms do you guys know of where there's, say, three people come home to the farm? Um, we'll just call them brothers to be simple. Um, but there's the, uh, in the, when the kids are in their 20s, they go from being perfect when they're teenagers. When the kids are in their 20s, uh, one kid, he doesn't make the cut. Right? He sleeps in, he's, he gets. He goes from being that kid that's, you know, at home living with mom all the time to the kid that has to go work and get an off-farm job. And then you got two brothers and a father farming together in the 30s. And then one day the boys get fed up with the, working with the old man. And they get rid of him. And then you've got two siblings farming together in the 40s. And then one guy doesn't like the other guy's wife. And so they split the partnership up because the accountants say, well, that's the easiest way to do it. And then you've got two guys in their 50s up to debt in their eyeballs. And that farm is not around 20 years down the road. How many farms, how many guys know somebody in their township where there's a similar situation happened like that? Right? This is the attitude we have in agriculture. Is unfortunately, we try to apply Henry Ford's attitude that people are expendable. Sorry, I got it. You have to forgive me. I, I came unprepared. I, I got a stone in my shoe. You know, how often do we as farmers have the common sense to sit down for a minute and take the stone out of our shoe? Right? But we, we don't have the common sense to sit down as a family and problem solve. You know, had I had this, this stone in my boot for a week, I'd have a sore foot. If I had this stone in my boot for a month, I'd be limping. Six months, I'd have to cut off my leg for gangrene. When I walk on these farms where I have to take firearms off in these crazy situations, these people are just walking around with 10 or 12 stones in their shoe, right? And all they're doing is throwing stones at each other. And what we've got to do is we've got to shift their attitude from blaming one another for the problems, right? This is an arrow on a guy's forehead, by the way. <laughs> just, just so you know. To shift the blame to actual production targets and getting it from a being emotional to rational decision behavior. So what I do is, again, as I meet with a family, this is actually a family business. They have 13 kids, if you can believe that. So I meet with this family, about uh, six, of the, uh, six of the kids. I can never count how many kids there are around the table on a month-to-month -month basis. And I do this on a uh, weekly basis. These two brothers, there's a brother that usually sits over here. And what I do is always continuously improve how they work together. And I'll just talk to you quickly about my, my methods. Um, Colonel Sanders doesn't give away his secrets. Usually there's ten, ten things I talk to on a, on a family farm. Um, but we'll just talk about three, three simple things. What I do... First thing is we get we go through Dairy Comp 305 or all the key production metrics. And we identify each family partner has to come to the table with one problem that they have with how the farm is running. So, for instance, on this operation, uh, 
you know, there, there might be a, a problem with um, what's a somat high somatic cell count. So a simple solution would be one partner would suggest let's get different milking procedures, start four stripping. Um, a second thing we talk about, everybody has to come to the table with a new idea that can't cost more than 5,000 bucks but it has to um, it has to return at least five thousand bucks within two two years or less, and it can be a simple uh, idea such as getting a new type of foam plan. It can be as simple as uh, changing um, setting up a policy on how you raise uh, raise your cattle so you don't hit them. It can be uh, things that cost no money but return high value, or it can be as simple as buying. A, uh, last week I had a guy we we, we bought a pig sorter. And they figured that they were going to save about seventy thousand dollars as a result of five thousand dollar investment in new pig sorter, uh, because uh, because they were able to sort sort through pigs easier. The uh, the third thing is we talk about pet peeves. Does anybody have any pet peeves with their siblings or the people they work with right now? Okay, I, I'm pretty sure. One simple example would be somebody sleeping in. Okay, I don't know if this happens in the operation. On a lot of operations we work with, one of the simplest pet peeves that we deal with is we set a policy of um, if you're more than late five, uh, five minutes late for, for chores, then you have to pay a fine. Okay, And if you have three partners and you've got 12 months that you meet on a monthly basis, that is 36 improvements in a year. And you want to talk about a family that cannot stand each other. Having a really good Christmas dinner get this system in place. So, you know, Colonel Sanders doesn't give his way secrets, but uh, does anybody here have an American dollar? Sorry. Do you have... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you... A, there's a dollar? Okay. So I'll give you... I'll give you... This is a Canadian toonie, so you can buy that at Tim Hortons next time. So, so this... I'll give away one key thing that I found in the last five years that I really learned is that accountability is everything. It's great to have all these ideas about how to continuously improve the operation, but what you need is an outsider to hold you accountable. And what I do with these families is I say, okay, we, we set, set the next month and if they say, did you get things done? Yes or no. And if they didn't get things done, the first time they have to give me a buck. The second time, they have to give me five bucks. The third time is 20 bucks, and the fourth time is 50 bucks. And if, if it's more than that, we have, we have a discussion. But the thing is that, you know, I've seen farms where, I'll give you an example. It was the third, third month I showed up, and Jan, he seen me coming down the laneway, and he says, oh shucks, I forgot. We had gone through, and we, they had a problem getting their heifers pregnant. And so, one of the possible things we identified was that they may have a stray voltage problem. And so when Jan see me driving down the laneway, he knew he was going to have to give me 20 bucks. So um, he, uh, he uh, called, called, called and got it sorted out. That was a $115,000 mistake. And what I have a policy with is we started off this process by giving money to charity. And then we started off the process after that, giving money to money, people you don't like. So we had people giving money to PETA. But, <laughs> right? And then, and then, to actually see money burn. Oh, well, maybe you should do that. <laughs> to actually see money burn. I'll give you a buck back, by the way. <laughs> I knew you would. Yeah, I know. Damn honesty. Anyways, <laughs> so yeah, sure, sure. So the thing is, accountability is everything. And if every time, uh, accountability is everything, and it can't be done internally. I've had families where we apply this method, and I had families where the day I showed up, the brother got back from rehab. Okay, they were never going to talk to each other again. They were a 300 cow operation. Each boy is going to go milk 100 cows, never talk to each other again. And uh, we started this process, and within two years, they built a $2 million expansion. And they just actually started calling me back 
because when they got building the expansion, they got busy, they said, we're getting along great, thanks for helping us, we can do this on our own. They found by having somebody else hold them accountable, it really made a huge difference. It's so mom doesn't have to nag, brother doesn't have to nag, everybody's held at the same level. When I'm on that farm, you have three siblings and, one, uh, and a father and mother all on the same level. When I leave, dad goes back to being the boss. And this is what, or, or in some cases, the son goes back to being the boss. But this is absolutely critical. I'll just talk about three advantages. How many people have tried to enforce communication by a glance or a stare that they're not happy about their brother sleeping in? How many times does this happen on family farms? Anybody have this situation on their farm? This is the, the guilt. How, time, how many times does that miscommunicate? Right? By having an outsider force you, A, to have the conversations that you need to have, that you don't want to have, and make sure that those are constructive conversations, not destructive conversations. So that when there's a time and place for basically the fit to hit the sham, and when that person leaves the farm, you go back to being a happy family. Absolutely critical. This is fundamental. So, I believe that any fool can give a son a tractor. Any fool can teach a son how to drive that tractor up and down the corner road. But very few farmers are successful in transferring wisdom to the next generation. I think that's absolutely critical. What makes a successful farmer is his obsession with control. The more successful you are as a farmer, the more obsessive you are about control and have a hard time giving that up and transitioning responsibility to the next generation. You also have a hard time that you're a doer, not a teacher. And there's nothing wrong with this. What, I mean, it's just your personality type. And what you need help with is over, I mean, for a lot of these men, everything they touch in their lives has always turned to gold. Unfortunately, in succession, they don't succeed because it goes against the personality type. So what you need, what I find, and here's the second thing. How many kids come home from agriculture college with a thousand and one ideas? And dad goes to the coffee shop and he brags about the first couple things the son's got in his head. And then about three, four years later, <laughs> he doesn't brag about those ideas anymore, right? Why is that? For a lot of farms, what we don't realize is that there comes a point where those ideas are seen as not innovative ideas on how to prove the profitability of the farm. They're insulting what dad has always done in the past. Right? And how do you come over this problem? This is a huge problem we haven't ever thought about. And how do you overcome that problem? Well, it's simple. You have everybody come to a family business meeting once a month with a new idea. And if you don't have an idea, you have to burn a buck. If you don't have a, I mean, uh, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So everybody has to come to the table with an idea. And I, here's a third issue that I have, and I hope you guys don't mind me talking about this. I believe that farmers should farm until the day they die. They might go golfing, they might not be involved in day-to-day -day operations. But I think it's important to include the senior patriarch and the matriarch in those family business meetings till until death do, the, do us part. And I think as, until, even if they're, um, you go through the process of transferring the assets, they should evolve from being the CEOs to becoming trusted advisors. And if, you know, because really, just because your body gives out, that gives you a bit more time to spend time on the internet or reading farm papers coming up with new ideas. And, and uh, quite often, I see family farms where the patriarch is still the majority, uh, has uh, preferred shares. And any big changes to the operation has to go through that principal shareholder. So the way to keep him engaged is to keep his input involved so that he's not saying, oh, that's, uh, I, I don't agree with you know, the way we're doing things anymore. You know, how many, how many operations have you seen this with? So, so 
the simple solution is to have a family business meeting once a month and have everybody come to the table with ideas. And one of two things happens. One is you get an improvement in efficiency. Or two, if you shut down an idea, it's because you weigh the pros and cons and you explain why you've done things the way you have in the past. And teaching wisdom is more important than teaching giving away assets. And too often, kids are told no to a new idea, no to buying equipment, no to doing this or that. And then 10 years after, when they get the hold of the farm corporation, they do exact opposite and run these farms in the ground. And that's how you overcome this issue. Now, we are getting, I'm really happy to see a lot of females. How many, how many girls are in this room going to go home and, farm, or home and farming right now? Okay. I'm really happy to see, see that in this room. We are getting really good at dividing assets equally among siblings, regardless of gender. But we are in the stone ages when it comes to grooming our daughters to becoming CEOs of the farm corporation. Am I right? How many farms do you see where as long as there's somebody walking around with a penis, that person's going to be the CEO of the farm? Right? And I have, there's, um, it's 5,000 years of chauvinism ingrained in our minds. I see guy, uh, farmers see, um, that are very open-minded, but it's just, we have chauvinism for 5,000 years. And the easiest way to change this is to have your daughters and your sons included in a family business meeting once a month. And, and I have farms where, I had a farm in eastern Ontario where the daughter, she was getting paid 10,000 bucks less a month, and it turned out she was working more hours than her brother was. And, and she wasn't even being considered as, as a successor, she was just simply a hired employee. And through this process of her contributing ideas, she actually had her degrees, her brother went to jail, that was his off-farm experience. <laughs> Only if he's doing a certain type of cash crop, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, point of it is, is that it's pretty obvious that she's the six, she's, we just incorporated that farm and she's the CEO. And it's because we've, over the last two years, we've been meeting monthly and, and she's been contributing to ideas and she's obviously the brains behind the operation. Now the third point is, if you have somebody showing up to your farm and forcing you to make in 10 different categories, improvements of efficiencies and how you work together and new ideas as far as production and problem solving, you know, the money that you're going to make is exponential. Okay? Does anybody, what's return on assets? Who, who here knows what return on assets is? Sir, what, what's return on assets? Well, we're kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe it other than how much you're making on your money. Okay. Are you farming yourself, sir? Yes. Okay, and what's, uh, what's your target return on assets in your, in your operation? Uh, somewhere between 10 and 15. Okay, so what would be 1% return on assets in your operation? 1%? Yeah, what would be, if you went from 10 to say 11%, what would, what would that be for just your operation? Yeah, roughly. Just roughly, ballpark. Give or take 100,000. You don't know. I haven't figured it out. I've Just. Quite a bit. Yes, sir. It'd be about twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay, which is that's one percent, which is essentially enough for your daughter and son-in-law to come home and farm, right? I think for a lot of operations, it's even a larger number, right, in this room, right? It all it all depends. But the thing is, what piece of equipment? Could you buy, or what type of change in fertilizer on your farm, or any type of agronomic advice, could you apply to your, your operation that could get you that return on investment? There, isn't, there, there might be one or two ideas, but there's not that many. What I'm talking about today is not change what decisions you're making on the farm, but change fundamentally how do you make decisions as a family change how you make decisions together as a family. And anything you can do 
to improve the quality of how you make decisions and how you get them into reality. That's going to result in profitability. Do you agree? You know, I believe in one, you guys can quote me in one thing. I think miscommunication in egos affects the farm's bottom line more than the markets and weather altogether. How many people agree with that statement? It's a matter of changing that in your operations so you reflect, your, your management skills reflect that. And so, yeah, I deal with succession planning. But, um, you know, what I've talked to you today about is farm management. And really, the transfer of assets has got really little to do with what I've been talking about tonight. It's got as much to do as me sitting, standing here looking in the corner. Um, how many, I, last Thursday night, I was working in a restaurant, and there was this kid, he, had, he was seven years old, and it's pretty obvious that parents never taken him to a restaurant before. And he had a temper tantrum right there at the restaurant. And it was a doozy. How many times, that's because his parents didn't sit him at home and teach the kid table manners every day. Anybody here have toddlers or grandchildren that are toddlers? It takes three to five years, doesn't it? As far as teaching your kids hot table manners. Is it not? Why is it in farming we expect to have a one-time family business meeting where we never sat down at the kitchen table before in a business sense and succession planning is the parents expected to be just like Christmas dinner where we divvy up the pie equally amongst the siblings never having sat down at the kitchen table before in a business context and expected to be just like Christmas dinner when we talk about warm memories in the family. Quite often that one-time family business meeting it's, yeah, um, it's, it's basically a situation where a pie gets in everybody's face or else you got one guy running down the, uh, down the road with the pie underneath his arm giving the finger. Is that not true? Right? It just doesn't make common sense. So what my, my recommendation is you start meeting with your family three to five years before you start even talking about succession planning and do not try to even start talking about succession planning until you can squeeze out an extra 10% profitability as a family within your operation. And that's for two different reasons. One, if you squeeze out an extra 10% level of profitability, your kids have had a part, uh, ability to do that. Second of all, you guys have the communication skills to be able to get ideas into reality. That's my rule of thumb. What I've talked to you today about is the science of decision making. Does anybody here, I'm just, to, just to, before I conclude, one more idea. Does anybody here know what FORD stands for? Well, I, what'd you say? Okay, so fix or repair daily. Yeah, I'm glad you know this. So back, basically back in the late 30s, um, Model T Ford, Ford had that culture one generation after Thomas Henry Ford started paying people five times the going wage. The culture at Ford was that everybody was expected to be perfect. And so they walked around and pretended they didn't, nobody made mistakes. And like Donald Trump, they spent half the time blaming each other for all the problems. And this guy walked in there and he says, I want to change your management culture so that you're able to get your ideas into reality. Now, Ford was used to people pitching them products, just like you as a farmer. You're used to somebody pitching you a new type of GPS tractor. Or an agronomist coming in saying, I know more about growing crops than you do. Hire me for my advice. They weren't used to ever having somebody with that specialized in decision science helping them out in their organization. So they told them to get, 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 get out of there. They kicked them out of the boardroom. So Neming went to this little country called Japan. And he went to this little bombed out factory called Toyota. And even though they didn't speak the same language, the Japanese got it. And as a result, he, got, he improved their problem solving techniques. So he got them to continuously pick the stones out of their, sho of their shoe and instead of blaming each other, which they used to do, sit down and problem solve and continuously evolve the operation. And as a result, the, the Japanese were able to build better quality cars, cheaper and faster. 
We never thought of, um, he introduced something called continuous improvement. We never thought about it, but that one man and his ideas, 50 years later, put GM into bankruptcy. Okay? Farming, as, as important as it is to be neighborly, is a competition to be the most efficient. You guys agree with me on that? And how do you become the most efficient? Let's look at the numbers. About 50% of family farms go out of business each generation. We could go on the statistics, but let's just say roughly 50%. I think it's going to be closer to 80% the next generation with the advanced technologies we have coming available. But let's think about somebody in 1970. Think about your neighbors back in 1970. Think about the big wheels in your township that are no longer there today. Think about the small players that started off with nothing that have built sizable operations. What was the difference between them? Okay, They all had access to the same tractors. They all could go down to the bank and get some money. They all could get fertilizer from the tractor dealership. There's plenty of these guys that adapted technology early and didn't make it work. What was the difference? It was the ability of these families to do three things. Make decisions and to improve the operation in the right way. Get those ideas in a profitability. And third of all, transition decision making to the next generation in the right fashion. So the next generation was better decision makers than the previous. I believe that the decade when the kids come home to farm and join the family operation is the decade when either the farm slingshots ahead or the fall, farm falls apart. Now, you can choose whether or not to listen to me. That's your choice. But the reality is that the more efficient you are as an operation, even if you are getting along great as a family, anything you can do to improve the efficiency of your operation is going to improve the probability that your family's name on the end of the mailbox, not your neighbor's. My name is Andy Junkin, and I improve how farm families make decisions together. You guys got any questions? Thanks. George. Andy, my, my first question is, how does the mailman put letters in that mailbox? <laughs> <laughs> well, probably with a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah. I'm stumped. That's a <laughs> Yes, sir. Back. I think I think monthly for for an outsider to come in. I th I think that you should have weekly meetings within the family as to what's going on for the week. Absolutely. So all the families I work with, we have weekly meetings. Um, I just feel that um, there's some things that you don't really want to bring up, and you just push those discussions off to that meeting if you can. Um, it's also, by somebody coming on the farm, it's forcing those conversations to actually happen, that need to happen. But yeah, weekly, week, I mean, a lot of families that work with, they, they, they have breakfast with each other daily too, right? And I encourage that as well. But there's, there's different levels of, of strategic uh, decision making that has, has to happen. Yes, sir. Um, I think the fact is that no farm has the time, but the reality is that they waste a heck of a lot of time because they don't have that meeting. And so that's the only value, like, yes, I have skills, but I, I see the real value is that somebody showing up to force that meeting to happen has got to happen, regardless of what time of year. Now, during spring planting, I don't have meetings, okay? During some parts of fall harvest, I don't have meetings. But having somebody to force you from the outside to have those discussions is absolutely critical. That said, um, I'm, I work with, the farmers I work with are pretty, it's a unique culture where I'm from. But you got to see return on investment. So I 
force people to burn money unless we make five thousand bucks each meeting. So if having some of uh, 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 wait, we, we've not five thousand dollars. That's for sure. <laughs> but every time, if I if 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 I'm not happy about guys doing their homework and uh, and brainstorming, I for usually about twenty bucks. And and the reason why is that you know, so if you have somebody showing up to your farm and he costs two hundred four hundred bucks for that meeting, and he's and in return you're getting between five thousand to whatever. Then it's, it's, it's a no brainer as far as return on investment. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So each month we, we go through the metrics, like uh, Dairy Comp 305, and we say, where are three areas that we suck? And that we got, we, we force everybody to brainstorm as to how to improve production. And then we hold every, we, we it's not just a matter of brainstorming. In the months following, we force you to, to uh, review those metrics to see did those, those ideas get implemented and where were we at with things. Um, one production improvement that improves profitability of farm by three times without spending more than 5,000 bucks, which I talked about before. Um, one way to improve chore quality or cut time. You know, there's, uh, there's I, I think, just want to give you an analogy of this. There's a lot of ways to milk a cow, as you know. Um, I, I think the uh, um, milking procedures, for instance, I had a situation where this, there's a, it was a smaller operation. There was two brothers and a, and a father. And uh, dad did the milking every other weekend. And on Tuesday morning, the cows all had mass size. And the reason was was because dad went back to his way of milking the cows. And he wasn't going to have anybody tell him how to milk his cows. right? And the boys had adopted force stripping in their own um, their own protocols. What we did was we got consistency, and as a result, uh, we had more profitability. Now, why did I tell you that? You guys all probably have standardized milking protocols in every operation in the in the state, unlike Ontario. But there's many ways to farm. There's many many ways to farm. But the more you guys can get consistency, even if you disagree with it. Sometimes there's give and take in an operation. And the more and more you can get consistency in how you do things and how you manage the operation, but also have somebody always have encouraged brainstorming, but also once you make a decision in the family, it might come up for review in a year's time, but let's get everybody consistent. It makes a huge difference to profitability and just day-to-day -day stress. Um, one pet peeve, um, what we do in our farm, uh, most of the farms I work with, it's either one complement or are two compliments, and then one pet peeve, and I think it's really important that uh, yeah, I think it's really important to have uh, catch people doing something good, and recommend that uh, discuss that, um, not just just talk about pet peeves. Child safety is a huge issue, and uh, a lot of the farms I work with are smaller operations, and child safety is I've actually seen that fall uh, cause families to fall apart. And so each person comes to the table with the new ideas to how to improve child safety. And then what we do is we also, when we got teenagers, you start talking about character. Because if you're, you know, a lot of these kids, uncle can't discipline the nephew when the kids are in their teenage years because he doesn't get along, uncle doesn't get along with the, uh, the sister-in-law. And all of a sudden you got these 23, 25 year old kids that are spoiled and in, integrated in this operation. And how does succession planning go from there? So what I think it's important, you, you have one, every month, if there's a time and place that uncle can give a critical feedback on that nephew and say, look, if he's going to be a successor in this operation 10 years from now, this is the, I expect him to show up at 4 o'clock in the morning to milk cows. It's the same like everybody else. And these type of things. Character's pretty big. Um, family and family business overlap. That's an undefined area, but I do spend a lot of time in this area. Um, I don't even know where to go with that. Like, um, I've seen s situations where the daughter-in-law didn't do a good enough job with the flower garden in the house, or cleaning the clean, and it caused such a rift within the family. Um, so these type of things where 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 business and business uh, family overlap, I deal with tactfully, and also identifying strategic opportunities. What I try to do is keep everybody 
to not talking about buying the farm next door the first meeting and talk we'll get families used to weighing the pros and cons of ideas and usually within 12 months um, making a decision to buy the farm next door or double the herd is not a big deal at all because the family feels comfortable with it even the most conservative uh, I've seen situations where guys would not let any decisions like he, uh, one far the father he wouldn't want to expand he didn't want the wa he, he wanted to control where the water bowls were put in a property he couldn't let that kind of decision go 12 months later he let his kids make the decision to buy the farm and he felt cool about it and his son-in-law called me up he says well I don't know what you've done with this man but 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 it's working keep doing it so does that make sense yeah. so that's my core agenda depends on the family yes ma'am I'd say my, for the families that are problematic that I deal with, um, getting everybody involved in the process is the biggest challenge. So I may be contacted by, to mediate a family dispute by a mom, but dad doesn't want to talk to me. And it's a matter of, of him actually meeting me and understanding that I think it's a lot based on the personality type of the person you've chosen to deal with your family issues. If you have somebody that wants to, everybody hold hands and sing Kumbaya, you can kiss that, that opportunity goodbye, I feel, in a lot of cases. You, you've got to have somebody from your own business culture that that person trusts. So, so getting trust with the, everybody in the family is, is probably, as a mediator, the biggest challenge I have. And uh, the families just have to realize that, how, what's your situation today and do you want to continue? Or do you want somebody that fundamentally lives to help folks like you help you out, or do you want to be miserable the rest of your life? It's really that simple. Yes, sir. Try to keep it two hours. Yeah, I think that. I mean, the operations I'm working with are pretty busy, and so two hours is the max. Sometimes it's three hours if it's winter, but if it's if it's spring planting, it's half an hour, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that's been one of the biggest challenges I've had to train myself as to how to read. Like you just can't have like I see mediators. They oh let's let's everybody get together in a, in a boardroom and let's do Myers Briggs testing, right? And I mean, most of my work is over a tailgate. When I start working with a family, I'm often sitting in a tractor and talking to guys one on one. And uh, so you have to be able to read personality types very quickly and. I spent a lot of time in developing that skill set. Like they're looking at their eye color. There's, you can tell a lot by people, people's the, the way different ticks like their eye color and different ways. But yeah, I, I, I'd say I don't have any. That, that, that's, that used to be my biggest challenge uh, seven years ago when I started this business. And that's probably one of my biggest skills now. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We just, we just treat them as part of the family. Um, depends on the family what they feel yeah so I mean there there's a lot of families where they might have five or six employees but we include one employee because that that per and then there, then I go we might have increased the scope based on uh, what we're covering that day um, so it all depends on the situation yes 7,000 acres um, biggest, as far as cat, that's a cash crop operation. Um, I'm just getting a couple thousand acres now, a couple thousand cows now. And on, to be straightforward, um, I used to think that, like our biggest, biggest in Ontario, we have I would deal with is 500 cows. And but it, when I'm starting working here, and it's, there's no difference. People are people are the farmers are the same wherever you go. And you know, I, I've. The biggest farm I personally worked on is a three and a half million acre station. I've worked on a lot of the largest in my younger days. I worked on a lot of the largest farms in the world, so it's not a big, big challenge. Yes, ma'am. How do you go about integrating um, members of the family that work off the farm into 
firm decision when they are major players financially, yeah. but perhaps not physically? Um, I think it all depends on the family situation. Um, there's some family members, I think it's important that they get to contribute like quarterly or annually if they're just silent shareholders in the farm corporation. If they're, if they're family members that they currently have an off-farm job, but their long-term goal is to be involved in day-to-day -day operations, the sooner they, we try to include them as many meetings as possible. Now due to scheduling, that might not always be possible. But, but it all depends on the family, but if there's a real intent to integrate that young individual into the operation, um, this process is actually a good stepping stone for that, for, for integrating them. I'm actually thinking about moms. Um, quite often, the wife is I'm, working off the farm and yeah. she's providing health insurance or whatever, That's, or a daughter-in-law yeah. has a real investment. Sorry, that, that's a different discussion. Um, I, I really try to encourage uh, wives to be involved in as many po meetings as possible. It depends on the family's situation, but if there's, if there's a, I sh and not just wives, but son-in-laws, but if there's a discourse, like quite often, as I said in the earlier, one comment that's made to improve the business partnership can be misconstrued by the other business partners and things just slide downhill, right? And, um, you know, if you uh, include the daughter-in-law, she might not have a lot of feedback on production matters, but if she's there and she has an opportunity to contribute whenever she feels like it's necessary, that, that gets rid of a lot of, a lot of, pro like I, I've mediated a lot of uh, divorces and this process really works. Uh, from two different angles, like, um, I'll give you an example. I had a daughter-in-law, her, I went to their wedding, and uh, anyways, the daughter-in-law had the kids in the car, and we went, we met at Burger King. I called her on her cell. Her husband says, yeah, you might want to help us out here. And I called her on her cell. She was packing up her kids, and they were going to Kingston, and that's, that's five hours away from the farm. And, uh, Got it all, and basically, her issue was that uh, the father-in-law didn't want to make any changes to the way they were doing things, and they were severely, severely understaffed. They had two hired men that had gone in the past year. One guy got hurt. One guy unemployed, and she had stuck up with that for quite a few years. But now they had two kids. She, she, he milked from four o'clock in the morning. They're milking 400 cows. There's two guys full time, and they had one girl doing herd health, and then they had some high school students do, doing the milkings. So severe, and they're uh, they're farming 1,400 acres on top of that. These guys, they didn't walk; they ran from one thing to another, and and all she wanted was Sunday afternoons for her husband to see her see her kids, and dad wouldn't let that budge, and so it he broke down. That that man. He looks like uh, Hulk Hogan. I don't know if you've ever seen. He, he broke down. I remember his fingers were like that. And he says, no, this is the way it is. And when he realized his grandson wasn't ever going to, he was ever, never going to be able to play with that grandson, things changed. And what we did was, we again, he expected things to be his way or the highway. He expected things to be perfect. And all, we, all that, that farm needed was a process of continuous improvement. And she loved her, she loved her father-in-law. He's a great guy, but she just there just needed to be some give and take, and so we we, we integrated her in the, in the family meetings, and they're they're getting along great. I actually married the daughter-in-law of that farm, on their farm, a couple years later. I'm a, I'm a reverend, so, so as well. Everybody's got to have a hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, her oh, yeah. So, to have value is well, in my opinion, I was in a, a a competition for farming in New Zealand, and this guy said, uh, "I said, well, how do you judge who is the best farmer?" And I said, "He says I interview the wife," and I said, "Well, why is that?" Like they were handing out the financials of the front gate, and we were talking about return on investments and everything else. He says, 
I can tell who's going to be a better farmer five years from now based on the amount of support and amount of interest that that spouse has in the operation. Now, she doesn't have to be involved in day-to-day -day operations. She can be a nurse and have her own life. But it's her support that's going to make that man successful. And I fundamentally believe that the spouses have to be involved in this business process of continuous improving, especially when it comes to work-life balance, right? Taking Sunday afternoons off. So, the, so uh, getting a high school students so that, uh, to cover the night milking on Sunday nights so that, that the son can actually know his kids and take them to the park or whatever. And, you know, that's fundamental. When we talk about prenups, that's a whole different issue in itself, let me tell you that. But I think it's really important that the daughter-in-law, even if she is involved in day-to-day -day operations, that she feels that her opinion matters and her opinion is being listened to and her opinion is being, being contributed. Now, it might not be that she gets everything she wants, just like it is with any operation, but it's very important that the, this, this has saved a lot of marriages. Let me tell you that. And a lot of people in my generation, this has this been the key determining factor. Me going in and mediating disputes, that's, that saved a lot of marriages of people your age, where mom is unfortunately stuck mediating disputes between father and son, and, and she just can't stand it anymore. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I have a 90.3% success rate. So, and, and it's usually 25%. So what I find usually with mediators is when they call you, it's a, okay, first of all, my life goal is to meet with all of you while your kids are 23 to 28 as they're coming home to farm and everybody's getting along great. And that's why I have a, a column in nine magazines, and that's why I've written three books. My life goal is to change how we're doing things. But unfortunately, a lot of the farms I meet are, it's a Hail Mary pass. And, and when I walk on that farm and I look at that mailbox, I know that I'm the guy that, if I don't succeed that day, that family's name is not going to be in the mailbox in five years' time. And I personally know what's not like to, as I said, to milk somebody else's cows 500 miles away from home on Christmas morning because your, your family's falling apart. My parents got divorced, okay? And so, um, yeah, folks are starting to trust me a lot more, more and more, because, um, but with succession, um, with mediation, unfortunately, most people, when they uh, contact you, as with marriage counseling, 80% of people go get marriage counseling, they fail, actually. Uh, most of the cases that they go see a marriage counselor, those people get divorced. And the reason why is that they're seeking forgiveness for what the sin they're about to do. And I, unfortunately, just don't let that happen. You know, I, if you call me on your farm, I'm not going to let you. I'm going to force you to problem solve. Because a lot of times people, they get mis mixed up in the forest for the trees, right? And they just simply need a little bit of help uh, getting out of the woods. A lot of people I'm dealing with, they're really good people. They're just a little bit mixed up. And you just need to, a few, uh, what, I, what I find is if you can pick away at a few little problems, get that sorted out, and then get a process of continuous improvement, you don't have all the problems solved in one day, but you, you change things. So, Okay? George. Who usually calls you in? Mom. <laughs> well, yeah, usually. Yeah, usually mom or, or the wife. Oh, she ever. A lot of times, a lot of times, mom's health is really on the brink. Yeah, usually when I when I get called out, and you know, my mom was, my mom got divorced because of what we had, so I can really relate with what these women are going through. Unfortunately. Do you ever consult with uh, farms that are bringing in someone outside the family? Yes. Yes. How yep. does that go? Um, it can go well. Um. I, there's there's a lot of complications to that, George. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you really got to have a process of always. You can find the ideal successor. It's the same situation as that daughter-in-law, where she's perfect one day, but then she's the witch that got, has to go. You have to have a process always improving that business partnership and how you work together, developing the character of the individual, 
and continuously growing that. And I think, I think the best place to find successors is from succession planning that didn't work. Okay? So there's often I see cases where, you know, there's several sons and one son got a raw deal. And you want to talk about a guy that walks into the situation and is grateful for the opportunity to prove himself, grateful for the opportunity to farm. That's where you get, that's where you get your successors, not from a headhunting firm. Yeah. There's a lot of good farmers out there that need the opportunity to make it happen. And I think what you're doing is quite interesting. Okay, well, thanks very much. Wow. Thank you very much, Andy. That's that awesome. A great way to wrap up the day. Appreciate that. That's awesome. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Oh, just, just oh. a second. I, I do a monthly newsletter. Oh. So if anybody wants to uh, get a whole, uh, me to send them a monthly newsletter, uh, just suck. Uh, for lack of a better term, we'll just, we'll just send, uh, pass these around, okay? And leave them on the table. And take, oh, sorry, take the CDs with you. There's my book, audio book, Farming with Family Ain't Always Easy. Um, it's an 80-minute CD that you can listen to on the drive home. And, and I guess the other thing is that um, I've got quite a bit of interest in the state uh, to consult down here. So I, I'm thinking about coming down here uh, a couple days a month. So if there's anybody's interested in talking to me about that, I'd love to, to talk to you folks. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> for those folks that will be coming back tomorrow, I know some of you are staying at the hotel. Uh, we will have breakfast uh, in the room where we had lunch at 7.30. Um, if you're going home tonight and uh, want to get here a little later, the uh, program will start at 8.15 tomorrow morning. So thank you, everybody. Safe travels uh, if you're headed home.